Welcomes please to our new councillor, Jacqueline Taylor, who will be uh, choosing to be on this committee um, with all her wisdom. We look forward to your contributions. We invite you to contribute as much as you like today because you're not a named member as yet. You won't be able to second or vote, but I don't think we'll be voting on anything anyway. But we really welcome your input and your perspective. So thank you. And then welcome to our independent director, Stephanie Malloy. Really uh, welcoming you on board. With that seat has been vacant for the first three meetings. Got big shoes to fill. Um, and again, we welcome your contribution, particularly areas of strong interest to you and around HR management, of which is a real challenge to this organisation and poses risks to us. And uh, any contribution that you'd like to make, or even things that aren't on the agenda, talk, have a chat first or raise them. And uh, if they're important to you, therefore they're important to this committee. So thank you and welcome. Okay, um, any notices, anything we need to uh, add to the agenda formally or have verbal discussions? James? Yes, Chair, I'd just like to add a, uh, a verbal item on uh, a request we've received from the Mangaharuru Tangitu Trust in relation to uh, our management of the Tangoyo Soil Conservation Reserve Funds. Okay, we'll put that towards the end there if we can. Um, out of nine, and you're comfortable that we have that discussion in public? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Uh, don't think there are any apologies. We're all here. Uh, just an apology from the Tapo Whakarai. Uh, oh, of course, yes. But he's not available. So. All right. Um, conflict of interest um, declarations, um, it's just if there are any matters that anyone has, um, please raise them uh, pertinent to anything that's on the agenda today. Um, but particularly our new members, um, the admin process may not have been completed, I don't know. Um, but just note that um, your conflict of interest um, documentation with Leanne is underway and it's quite a thing we need to have sorted probably before we go any further. If there are any things on here which you feel you may be conflicted on, uh, please flag them. It doesn't mean you're precluded, it just means we're flagged and keep everyone safe. So we'll have that all sorted. Okay, confirmation of the minutes of our previous meetings, 4th of August and the 18th of August. It seems at least one COVID level ago. Um, anyone have any issues in and around those? Neil, have you had a look at those? Yeah, they're fine. You're comfortable with those? As, re as is? They're beautiful. Thing. No spelling mistakes? Can you... I'll move those then. Uh, Trump made a second. No, Neil, Neil second. Thank you very much. So we're through those. Okay, our agenda today, we just, we do have a drop dead time to finish, which is 12, I think, given our council activity later in the day. Hopefully we won't go that long, um, but that's really up to us. Um, so, Audit New Zealand report um, for the year ended 30 June 2020. Everyone waits for this one with bated breath. Um, Jess, would you? Presumably, sure. you'd like to be talking I'll to this one. Just the paper. I'll invite Ross um, up to oh, there you go. to make comments, um, particularly on the, the management comments um, in response to the uh, the recommendations made by Audit New Zealand. So this report presents the recommendations, uh, the findings from the auditors uh, on the audit for the year ended June 2020. Uh, noting the delay in the timing of the delivery of the report, um, the audit was completed um, or delivered later uh, than ordinarily due to the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the year end uh, uh, 30 June 2020. So the audit um, was effectively signed off uh, much later than ordinar ordinarily uh, in the financial year. Um, there are a number of recommendations um, and findings from the auditors. And I think it's fair to say that um, we have continued to build um, the capability of the finance team um, over the past um, six to 12 months. And um, in recent conversations with the audit director, with Karen Young, our audit director, she's been very complimentary um, about the continuing building of the capability of the, um, the senior um, accountants or the account accounting team within the finance team and um, she's feeling um, comfortable that we are continuing to build that capability and capacity within the team 
and that many of those recommendations that we are um, aiming to resolve in the current um, audit, the 2021 audit, will be uh, closed out and um, that we will complete um, those recommendations um, within the current year, year end audit. So, um, yeah, I think the combination of addressing some of those recommendations through um, process, um, through technology, through the Tech One implementation, and through adding um, capacity and capability, through adding uh, resource and building the capability in the team, will resolve some of those issues uh, that are identified through the report. But uh, we're happy to take uh, specific questions um, to answer any questions that you have on specific items in that uh, paper. Okay, I thought you were very gentle in uh, the, your lack of commentary on the consequences of um, the delay from their end. Um, other organisations I'm involved with, it is very, very frustrating. We will understand the reasons why. Um, but I note, um, and hello Karen if you're watching, um, the, the, the consequences to this organisation's certainty and processes is when governmental agencies and things that we're required to do by statute can't be fulfilled. Um, and the, uh, if you turn the coin around, if we don't deliver upon required dates under statute or regulation, um, quite rightly someone comes after us with a bit of a stick and uh, that needs to be shared both ways. Um, again, we understand why, COVID, etc., but we're having consequences this year as well um, with many organisations. Um, just also the presentation of... Uh, there's some great headlines in the auditor's finding if you are a mischievous journalist, but then the explanations are very real, mundane and quite fair. And do you have a... or have you had a discussion with them around some of the findings, for example, councillors um, in one training underpaid and the others overpaid, great fodder for journalists. Um, and actually it's not true, as you've shown. Is, do you have a discussion with them as part of the audit journey to, their findings are what they find and they're independent, I understand, but some things actually, one more phone call obviously seems to satisfy a lot of these issues as the explanations down the right hand column can I present. Have you got any comment to that? Or, or are you gonna, without prejudicing your relationship with them? Um, I don't mind about my we relationship. We have a good, with them. we have a, uh, from my perspective, we have a good relationship with Audit New Zealand. Um, we have a good relationship with the audit manager, with the audit director. Um, I think traditionally the auditors, they probably have standard headings and classifications which um, the adjustments or the recommendations fall under. I'm not sure that they have um, a lot of discretion under which they classify probably the recommendations. So um, I wouldn't make comment probably around how they've described uh, how the recommendations are listed um, or classified. But yes, probably they do look like they've sensationalised potentially um, some of the recommendations. But um, we could probably have a conversation around how the um, the management report is, um, I suppose, described. Well, I mean, perhaps that's why you're in that job. I'm, I'm in this year. one. Um, so so that, that, that's fine. And again, I understand that as we go through, and I'll go around the table, and if you want to make some, some comments as well, um, just I think we just should note the consequences of this, these timings being delayed or different to this organisation um, uh, um, when we get to our recommendations, perhaps. It can only be a noting, but we just ponder or think about that. Um, sympathetic to the reasons why, but under law, no one cares. It's a very black and white line. Would you like to, any further quick questions or comments, or are you there to take the questions? Yeah, uh, it, it probably was a more challenging year. Like, I sort of worked with um, our audit manager, Megan, to add, add some little bit of commentary on some of these. Uh, as an example, the, you'll, at the end of the report, there's previous recommendations that haven't been cleared. Well, one of the things that occurred is, is due to all the circumstances, audit didn't have time to actually relook at some of those, and so they're still sitting on because they didn't actually get looked at. So you can't say categorically yes, no, are they still valid or not? And hence the sort of commentary that was added to that. But it's, I guess, it's, we're so far down the track from when the audit happened that it was, we're just more focused on putting it behind us. 
we've actually got a team of auditors here auditing um, for June 21. Oh, yeah. Um, I felt their presence. They're here this week. <laughs> <laughs> so we're already into that process. Uh, I hear what you're saying. No worries at all. But it, again, it just this came up, but not this committee, CNS committee, the larger council and other organisations. So I think it's just worth noting, because at the end of the day, as far as this organisation is concerned, um, the record will show there are things in there that are outstanding, which doesn't reflect as good as it could be on this council. And I, in my opinion, but we can talk about it, we need a little bit more explanation, maybe just in our recommendations or something. But we'll ponder that. Neil, have you got any thoughts on uh, Audit New Zealand's report on us or anything in around that? Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I, I can't recall utilising the same format um, that's here. I can't recall having seen this um, uh, you know, orange, brown and yellow. Uh, traffic light scenario and the, and the way that the, the necessary urgent necessary etc is is it am I did I miss something last year or is this new? I think this is new. Yeah. This is new format. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, quite interesting. Um, I, can I? I'll just go to um, uh, their lately I guess their key recommendations, which is one point one. Um, and the only urgent item there is accounting policies are standard across, standardised across the group. Um, are they not standardised? The issue that popped up the last port. audit was around the revaluation of land and buildings at the port. Yeah, that was um, specifically related to the Napier port, um, oh, okay. the valuation of the port so buildings. By group they mean across, yeah, uh, across the group and um, port, port holdings yep. limited. Yep. Yeah, which we have. Um, so we've done that? Yes, we have, yeah. Okay. So they've adopted our policies or we've adopted theirs? Yes, we have. They have been, they have been valued this year. Sure. Um, the um, councillor remuneration thing, I, those councillors need to be named and shamed, I would have thought. Well, I, I, need, I agree those ones that are on the previous council, yes. <laughs> To be absolutely clear on that, uh, councillors will always be paid in accordance with the, um, the determination and indeed on this case they were, uh, it was just that uh, in the preparation of the, the annual report uh, there was um, a calculation done as to the total remuneration that didn't line up with A, the determination and B, what, what was actually paid. So, so have they been paid what they were meant to be paid? They were paid what they were meant to be paid, correct, yeah. yes they were. They were paid correctly, but a report to the auditors, um, there was a problem in some calculation there. It looked yep. like they hadn't been. Correct. Okay. So actual payments, the real world was fine. Sure. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, 2.4, um, uh, quality and timeliness of information provided for audit. Um, I've, some of that surprised me, those various comments there. Um, um, so they, they want... Um, a well-documented protest a process to ensure end of year financial statements and trial balance can be pulled from the current financial system. I thought we had that. So these comments probably, I think, related to some of them related. I think some of the um, failings of our previous system. So we have just implemented a new financial system. So our previous system, we knew, wasn't really fit for purpose. Sure. Um, and we did struggle to. We couldn't produce financial statements from the old system. Um, yep. So we had a, a really manual system. We had a lot of um, manual spreadsheets, and we were pulling a lot of um, information from various uh, manual spreadsheets to to produce financial oh, okay. statements. So that will improve uh, with the new system. Sure. So it's it's that improvement. Okay. The the other one was um, uh, it, it does the, the new system allow us to run six and nine month financial statement report for a full stomach statement report? Yes, it will. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, there was something else. That fair value, fair providing management, fair value assessments early on in the audit process. Is there any reason we can't do that, or have we not done that in the past? Is our, our non non valuation year, non revaluation year. Which comment? Uh, two, two, uh, two point four, the last dot point on page uh, seven or eleven. 
sort of bought. Revalued assets in a non-revaluation year, providing a management, provide, providing management's fair value assessment early in the audit process. It's just a timing thing. You know, the 2020 audit was, you know, problematic, not only just for COVID, because effectively, you know, Tim who actually did the annual report and joined the organisation in, I think, December 2019. Sure. So he was picking up and trying to actually understand how, you know, previous people had done some of the work, sure. so as well as pulling it together. So, um, yeah, some of those ideal processes. I think that just we're to actually look, looked at, but they will be going forward. And that talks to some of the this comment in there, I think, from the auditors around some of the personnel changes that we had in the sure. specific okay. audit. Um, so, it's, 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 yeah. in other words, it's a fair cop. Um, yeah, from that's, their yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's yeah, right. There are some comments in sure, there around yeah. the personnel changes we had um, specifically related to this yeah. particular audit. Yeah, I, I, I thought some of the comments looked to be particularly picky, and I wondered why they were there. I think it was probably quite a challenging audit um, with the impacts of COVID and with the ch personnel changes that we had in the accounting team at the time. But it was on um, both sides of the fence. It absolutely it? was, yeah. So, But anyway, uh, the corrected misstatements was intriguing. Mm. Um, um, the ACC liabilities, um, what, what are they saying? We just hadn't um, made those, or we'd, we'd, we hadn't made provision? That's on, if we take you to page um, Appendix 3, Corrected Misstatements, page 31 or 35. <coughs> ACC liability movement. Um, and you saw that come up via the Council of the that's recent right. accounts? Yeah. That's what you saw. You want to, can you talk to that a bit further? And uh, maybe a, just a context. Um, for our, our new members in particular. The Council entered a, an agreement, what, about six, seven years ago, um, as part of its funding of um, options for the Rotana for water scheme. Um, and one of those was to kind of securitise rev, future revenues from its leasehold properties, package those up, entered a deal of arrangement with ACC. So. The council got a lump sum, which was used towards infrastructure type capital, and we still receive the leasehold uh, revenues, the rentals, etc. But it's pretty much mirrored. Like, those funds go back out to ACC by and large, a small margin in between. And then recently, council saw a relatively significant amount uh, uh, of change in its balance sheet. Um, was that 20 mil? Mm. Uh, about 20 million. Um, so, so. The context of this and the auditors have picked it up and the consequence of that and other examinations of this have obviously starting to come together so that's context there Jess if you could um, pick up Neil's question and anything else please. I'll hand over to you Ross. Oh, Ross yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well so obviously it's just one of the many processes within it and because that's unique to this organisation so it may not have been picked up initially so a lot of the initial work would have been feeding off what was done previously. Um, so we're certainly well and truly on top of that area now, and it's obviously you know, there'll be specific discussion with the audit on that adjustment that we've you know, made uh, this year around that ACC liability. So that's, I'll put it down to learnings in terms of big ones. Well, that yeah, well, you know that twenty million dollar adjustment is. We just looked at the nature of the agreement and actually what our obligations are under that agreement and it's the liability had just been based on the historical um, values rather than actually saying as our land value moved we had we'd been pushing up our land the value of the land but we ignored the fact that two-thirds of any increase we had an obligation to pay over so we had a so we had been recognizing the growth in the liability as the value of our land went up so we, yeah and there's kind of a parallel universe here, and we've seen that amount come through the most recent accounts at Council, I think it was, and then this is a backward-looking report, but this is that they're in the same space. So, to, to, again, to Neil's question, other just learnings. The tough question here is, at that very moment, therefore, our accounts of the previous years since that deal was signed were um, 
incorrect to the tune of the ACC liability because it didn't appear on the liability Correct. side of the balance sheet. And now that's been corrected. And, yet, and that's something we've, you know, that's something that wasn't raised by audit, it's something we've identified ourselves. Yep. And we've, you know, make, made the adjustment, which we then work our way through with audit to obviously they'll, they'll Good check and verify we it's valid. Sorry, Neil, I could have took over you a wee bit there. And just finally, um, in that um, section on um, misstatements, um, the corrected performance reporting misstatements, um, uh, I found those interesting as well. That's on page 32 or 36. Um, Which ones in particular? Uh, well, the water consented as a percentage of the allocation limit um, and um, the additional area of highly erodible land planted in tr and tresses. Um, uh, incorrectly calculated. So, so what? What are the? What? Where do, have we? Where are those figures now? What do we do with that? So, my understanding, um, and I'll be corrected by the team if I've got this wrong, is that uh, these were adjusted prior to the finalisation of the annual report. So, it was through the audit process. These were. Um, you know the particular non-financial metrics that were picked up as sure. having methodological errors in them, yep. and in, through discussion with staff, they were then subsequently corrected. So we've got the correct figures in the annual report. In the final annual yes. report, yes. Right. Yes. Yep. Yes. Thank you. I think that's important. But okay, Neil. That's fine. Thanks. Will. <coughs> um, my, yeah, my inquiry was around that NAPI port um, change in policy, which has kind of been covered and. Sounds like it's all solved, so... Okay. That, and that was a significant hunk of sand in the wheels of this organisation, HBRIC, and, and frustration for the port themselves, I understand. Um, which is, what, again, why I'm quite keen to reflect something in our recommendations in and around this. Um, OK. Jacqueline, first um, uh, thoughts on what you've seen here? Well, not too, not too many comments on the audit, except that there's been a lot of learnings from it, which is really great. And I think, um, well, what's great from that is that six, the last six to 12 months, you've been building that financial capability and getting better systems. So that's, that's great credit and um, pleased to hear that. And um, that, that's right. So it's, it's quite interesting that coming in fresh, uh, well, well, new, unencumbered by some of the knowledge we have, um, your first examination of things of the council, that and by and large is pretty good. Um, and and that, that is, I think, to be noted all the time, and that the level of professionalism and transparency and kind of corporatisation, if you want, of processes in the council is, is uh, a credit to, to the team. Um, it's lumpy and takes a bit of courage to bring that on board, but boy, it helps later on. Okay. Chair, I'd just a r remark really for um, uh, the benefit of both um, Stephanie and, and Jaguan. Um, as you interrogate our financial accounts, you'll quickly realise how complex they are, and that's a largely a function of the diversity of um, services, um, schemes, um, different policies that have been applied to a whole range of different things over a long period of time that all have their own bespoke financial arrangements. Um, so um, from, a, uh, from a financial management point of view, there's lots of moving parts that all interact together. Um, and I, I often reflect on decisions made with the best of intentions at various points in time historically by councils to introduce new services or um, new initiatives with um, their own particular peculiar financial arrangements, um, whether it be borrowing, whether it be um, some form of user charge, some form of grant funding, uh, etc. It actually creates complexity on complexity on complexity and so we end up with a, with a very complex financial system which creates all sorts of headaches for Jess and Ross and the team. But um, yeah, it's, it's the, I guess it's the nature of a public sector organisation that doesn't have a simple set of um, revenue streams and a simple set of expenditure streams in a very highly regulated environment as well, <coughs> in all aspects. Stephanie, your, your thoughts? Um, just a couple of queries related to the, um, the ACC point. I guess it's context, really. Um, that's not something that had been picked up or even got close to being touched on in prior audits? No. no? It's not something that had been raised. Um, 
and so we looked at it and we discussed it and so um, and Rod invited itself so things do get missed so so that was something that was picked up internally and that was like picked up internally and it's a bit like I suppose you, you look at the one with the port um, land that had been a mismatch of accounting policies for some years until it popped up in the last audit Mm. Um, it's not and sometimes as it's it can new. be interpretation of a different yeah. audit manager or a different audit director having different interpretation of accounting policy. Um, yeah, so it's just quite interesting if you get a different audit manager or a different audit director, they'll quite often have a different interp interpretation of, of a previous, yeah, someone who's worked on the, on the audit in, in um, previous years. So, yeah. I think this one could have been, you know, you could, at one level was arguable on the margins. The liability doesn't arise until the property transaction actually takes place. But we were booking the uh, the upside, I guess, in terms of the um, capital value uh, growth of those assets without recognising that at some point, in all probability, uh, they, they would be freeholded and, uh, and there would be um, a liability associated with them. But look, um, I think you could also argue that you know, for various reasons, the, the freeholding uh, might scream to a halt tomorrow, and uh, and people might stop doing that, and uh, and we the, no more transactions might occur, and that liability might not exist. So it's one of those ac accounting treatment issues that I think um, you know is is arguable on the margins. But I think the way that we've now reflected it reflected it is the conservative approach, which is to say, you know, if we think there's a potential liability there, we should we should book it uh, and not just take the upside. I think, um, sorry to interrupt, Stephanie, I think actually it's now correct and there's a contractual liability and it was there perhaps is, yeah. early on a confusion between the checkbook and the balance sheet yeah. because mm. you took cash up front mm. for in exchange for the, the revenue flows from an asset. Yeah. So at the same time, at that moment, someone forgot to do another entry on the ledger. You know, that, that's as simple as that. And now it is correct because regardless of people freehold or not, we have a contractual liability on the books, no different to a lease of a building, for example, cash versus a 20-year lease or whatever it might be. Under IFRS, it's got to be recorded. So anyway, it's much tidier and now. Sorry, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. no, no, Ross, were you going to say something Well, else? I was going to say, and it's also like, we will have the discussion with audit. You know, there's the debate, discussion as to whether it's a, a straight liability or is it contingent liability. We've taken the approach because the contract actually sold 50 years worth of future rents, and we've got 42 years to go. On and you know, I think we've, and from my knowledge, there used to be about 1,200 leasehold properties, only about 290 now. Mm. Uh, the probability in our mind is that most of those will be freeholded in the next 42 years. Um, so that's why we're leaning towards saying we'll recognise the liability um, because under that agreement we can't avoid, as they get freeholded, we have to pay two thirds of any capital gain to ACC under the contract. Mm. And, and a, a related question really depends. In, in terms of context and harking back to what happened when you put that arrangement in place, was there um, were there external advisors involved in, how, in setting the deal up that you might have expected this to have been flagged at that stage? We would have hoped to. I don't, I, yes, yes, I don't know. We've actually seen it, it predates all of the predates the, the all, the, all the management, all the staff thing, and all the right. um, people here. Um, but, so that's yes, there were two thousand and thirteen. Yeah. I think yeah. it was and. Yeah, I'm not too sure whether the analysis actually looked at what will happen with capital gain and freeholding, but it's in black and white in the contract, so um, it's something we That's right. can't get out. So, so what processes can you put in place to stop that sort of eventuality occurring again with, with another area of the, of the complexity involved in, in, the, in the council's revenue and so forth? Well, in terms, and obviously, it's more about that, that transaction and the due diligence around that, that transaction, which, um, you know, so we've got to make sure this all elements of a contract are actually reviewed and actually translated into potential um, scenarios in terms of what it might, might mean. Um, unfortunately, you know, I don't have the, the knowledge of going back. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a tricky scenario when you get these, no doubt, quite complex legal documents. Um, and then working out what needs to be implemented practically. 
um, to make sure that everybody's complying and some people think you pop those documents in the bottom drawer and forget about them but actually they you know ideally they should be living breathing documents that you continue to refer to and um, we've got ongoing obligations under that in terms of reporting and whatever so actually the document sits next to my right. my desk because it's we do have to keep an you know no one understand it because we have to do like monthly quarterly half yearly yearly, yearly reporting and we actually have to get an audit um, of our done for ACC as part of that, under that contract. I think also the benefits of some of those change policies and in, in, in internal infrastructure that's been brought in over the last couple of years. So I think this issue started to raise, we, we, we pulled in a treasury policy, the entire assets exposure this council has at the very top of all these other subsidiaries, if you like. And I think there was some revenue in one line from an ACC or a leasehold property or something, and a discussion was, I think, and I do recall it actually coming up at that stage and, and starting to have some fresh eyes have, have a look at it. So, so the key question now is A, it's been picked up, B, it's been incorporated, C, you're confident that everything's in place, um, that you've examined it and it's now correct as far as your financial obligations, reporting obligations are concerned and the ratepayers have the best representation of the accounts as, as you understand it. And lessons are learned every day, but this is quite a big one. Yeah? Okay, well, um, okay, I'd, I'd just like to add, uh, so if that's, there's no more to talk about or issues to raise there, I just want to take us back to the recommendations in the paper, which is on the staff's paper, which is on our page 33 on our, no it's not, it's on page something. What's the page, Leanne? Our staff paper on this report is where the wrecks are. Totally lost it now. Oh. Page the re recommendations are we receive and note it. It's all very nice and cuddly. Um, no, Mr uh, Chair. Yes, um, Neil. Uh, I just, uh, I'm Thanks. a little uncertain about the, the wording of these recommendations, I would have thought that the Finance Audit and Risk Committee uh, recommends to Corporate Strategic that Corporate and Strategic Committee ex ex accepts, receives and accepts the report. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's in the power of this committee to actually accept the report and then Corporate and Strategic sends that up to Council for actual yeah, well, that, I don't know. We, we accept many, many reports. So, what is the technically, uh, which is where Neil was, is particularly interested in? Sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, the this subcommittee is actually um, in accordance with its terms of reference is the body to um, accept this report. Yeah, I'd have to see that, and I'm not convinced. Can we can we let that lie for the moment and have a look at it, or do you want to be satisfied further? Or well, we, can, we can just change the rec for the sake we, of this one to we, we clarify. Know, we, 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 we've got recommendations that the council accepts the report, and it's the council that does that. Not, in my view, neither FARS nor Corporate and Strategic. All they do is make recommendations to council to accept it. It, it, I don't think that we're well, actually yeah. within the power of the organisation that mm. a subcommittee would mm. would would accept. Mm. Um, well, you're right in that sense. And FARS basically has very little decision making ability. It's just at corporate strategic at the very least. So not even that. I think it's a council document uh, that needs to accept an order report. It's a council that does that, not 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 a committee. Leanne, you arguing? You'd argue that? Think the other way. And if we do change it, that therefore probably means we have to change every other recommendation along these lines we've made? Certainly there's no harm in making the recommendation that the um, Finance Audit and Risk reports through to the Corporate and Strategic. Um, where this could get complicated is then it would be the expectation that the full report would go to the corporate and strategic and be discussed. Oh, CNS is uh, that, that right? 
if, if it wishes to, but I guess we, we, we just to. get into the to the, the well, we get into the situation where um, two committees are doing the same piece of work, um, and the FARS committee exists uh, to do this deeper diving into these matters. Uh, that the corporate and strategic uh, doesn't need to. Um, it's essentially the fundamental purpose of, of this committee. Uh, the recommendations are not intended to bind council or be a decision on behalf of council, um, but I do think that uh, this committee, particularly having an independent member, it is useful for this committee to, uh, to receive note and to accept uh, our reports. Um, I, I, think, I think you're missing my point. Um, there's no trouble with that. What I'm suggesting, though, is that uh, ultimately, and it'll be interesting to know through the Local Government Act, what the obligations of council are in accepting a report. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, once you once you if, accept or adopt at a council level, that's a different thing than sort of it's it's big A versus small A. On, on that's right. So that's why, for example, with the annual report that would always be framed as something that you would recommend through for adoption but ultimately sure. by council. Sure. I think for the purposes of the audit report we wouldn't see that as something that council itself needs to uh, accept or adopt. But, yes, that's, yep. what I'm, that's my point, is, is that uh, there are certain documents that uh, uh, formally need, the adopt, need to be adopted or accepted by council as opposed to a committee. Of which this is one. Oh, of which this is one. Of which is one. So, so a couple of points there is, um, from what you're saying, Lee, and this is consistent with what we've used in the past, um, can, uh, so without create, opening a big can of worms, and with respect to Neil's point, can we, is there, uh, just, just do a double check on the terminology we use, because it affects us, CS, and of course the council itself. The, term, the terminology in the recommendation, Neil, are you comfortable? Oh, I'm this happy with the wording as yes. it is. Yes. However, we do I'm need, an, in my view, we need another a recommendation at council yes. to accept it. Yes, yes, yes. You get that, Leanne? No. So at CNS, we'll make sure that's in there, right? We'll have that Accept discussion. the report. We're going we're, we're to take the report, but we need your advice on, to Neil's point, the council's receiving a document which comes from a, an, an arm of government, it's a very uh, important report, and we need to formally acknowledge it at a council level, not just at a, a sub sub level. So can we, can we we're going to leave the recs, that rec as it is, and just revisit this at CNS, so we have it right by the time it gets to council. Are you comfortable with that, Neil? Yeah. Okay. Uh, to make to make the point, I mean, with for example our um, risk maturity report, that's an internal thing, which uh, we 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 would quite correctly accept because that's the mandate of this committee. I, I totally accept that. But it'd be interesting actually to identify those reports which would require, the, if you like, the royal assent of council to to be adopted. So, point. so could, could we just, could we just rest that and, and that so, if you'd particularly like, yes. as Neil has gone there, that internal external is quite right, right, the distinction between the two and the wrecks that evolve from that. So, um, we should probably have another look at the terms of reference because at the moment it does say that the purpose of the Finance Audit and Risk Subcommittee is to report to the Corporate and Strategic Committee to fulfil its responsibilities for the independence and adequacy of internal and external audit, um, compliance with laws, regulations, standards, etc and specific responsibilities and authority to satisfy itself that the financial statements and statements of service performance are supported by adequate management sign-off and adequate internal controls and recommend adoption of the annual report itself. So, 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 so Chair, I think w w what's implicit in that is that the audit opinion is absolutely something that goes to Council for adoption. This is a review of the audit process, and this is something that we would have historically felt is for this committee to review. How has the staff, Audit New Zealand, interacted in the development and review of the uh, annual report? Um, and to any, any recommendations about improvements would be s s resting at this committee level. 
that would not be something to take through to full council. Um, but that's over to you. If you think that that's something that council that you feel that council needs to adopt, my point is you're starting to get both the CNS committee and council doing the work of this committee. Um, yeah, well, we certainly don't, don't want that. But either of those committees can choose to do whatever they like of, course. of, of this. But just hearing that, Leanne, can we just again? And it's actually seen as Neil's committee. But can we just have a quick? We'll ask you to go away, and when we come to our next seniors, can we just have a verbal on those? Because because they, they, they both can be true. What James said internal, and it's our report on our staff's report. But actually, we've got this, this very significant document coming through. Which who on earth are we to accept that? Having said that. It's the interpretation of our terms of reference just there. Okay, I'm quite keen to move on from here. Yes. Uh, well, I would like to add a recommendation which reads, um, if you're comfortable with that, thanks for that discussion, is something like um, that the Finance Audit and Risk Subcommittee um, notes um, the consequences of um, audit report delays on this organisation and um, and other parts of this organisation or something. That's not very good English, but um, I'm quite happy to just leave it there. But in other discussions, other members of this council have expressed very similar points of view with perhaps some more adjectives. Can you read that back, please? Are you okay with the, um, the sentiment there? Can you read that back, Leah? So the recommendations as they stand are that the Finance Audit and Risk Subcommittee receives and accepts the Audit New Zealand report on year ended 30 June 2020 and advises the Corporate and Strategic Committee accordingly and notes the consequences of audit report delays on the organisation. Separate rec actually. Yes. We note. Yeah. So number one is our stands, number two is that little bit I've just added in. Yes. Sorry, and it reads, what's your better version of it? And notes? Notes. The consequences of audit report delays on the organisation. Is that sufficient or would that, you...? Well, that, that'll do. I, I just want to put that there for the record. Are we OK on that? What's, um... OK. All right. So I'll move both of those. Will, are you good to second that? Thank you. Seconded by Will. Favour. Passed. Aye. Thanks. OK. Can we go to the... Uh, Thanks, Ross. Um, the non-financial report, the more I read this uh, uh, annual report of draft non-financial results, can you just, someone give us the context? Um, point two there, the outcomes were presented to Corporate Strategic on the 18th of August. Feedback from that meeting has been incorporated, and we've kind of come in back around the loop. Um, Councillor Curtin or Jess or someone, can you just remind us what's going on there? Um, have seen some of this before, or at least had a discussion about it. I'm just kind of trying to work out how it's it's back here. So we're we're reiterating uh, on the uh, finalisation of the uh, the annual report, and I guess um, just given the the delays, uh, both uh, as a result of the internal issues and the issues with audit in Zeb, which we've covered extensively, um, uh, we were keen to get as much through to council for early. Um, uh, input as possible, hence taking the opportunity with CNS on the 18th of August to present some of it. So there is a bit of duplication and, and we've got our meeting cycle this year um, somewhat um, messed up in relation to FARS and CNS um, and so we've got, including you know, for the remainder of this year, a, a, an a unusual sequence of um, uh, FARS meeting after CNS if you like. Right. Okay. So all right. So it is just a bit messy, and we just um, we we ask for your uh, patience and forgiveness as we iterate towards finalising the annual report, um, and just welcome the input from um, from this committee and obviously from council more broadly oh, on its content. You have our patience and forgiveness every day. And as yours, is someone want to come to talk to that? Okay. Cheers. Sarah, can you and Mandy just introduce yourselves, obviously, sure. as we've got some new committee members? Sure. Um, Marana Koto. Uh, my name's Sarah Bell. I'm um, the team leader for strategy and performance. Um, I work under Desiree. Um, and Mandy is the project manager within that same team. 
and we've co-collaborated on the non-financial sections of the annual report um, along with um, us, the wider staff who um, input the commentary as well. And Mandy, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you. If you give, you give some headlines, intro to your paper in particular, yeah. there might be questions in around that. And yeah, then sure. Okay. Go through the, the paper itself. Well, well I'll take the, the, the paper as um, read, but I guess some highlighting some of the key points, um, as James pointed out, that we have presented some sections of this at the Corporate and Strategic, strategic Committee, and we use that opportunity to incorporate the feedback into um, a revised document that's um, here as well. Um, the additional points are the regional highlights that we didn't have in our original document and the introduction to the uh, report. So there are some slight differences to what we've done in the annual report in, from previous years. Um, so we would have the opportunity um, to answer questions about that. But it's also um, important to note this is the final year of our long-term plan for 2018 to 20. Eight, um, and also we're using the 17, um, 2017 to 21 strategic plan to inform those community outcomes as well. Um, so, and I uh, also, um, this has just gone to audit um, and we will be working on a summary document um, with our communications team um, subsequent to this meeting. So happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. And, and and I may well have talked about some of these matters at CNS. I'm oh, sure. Um, so, so apologies if I have, but that's still pertinent to me. Um, so we'll go through it. Just, just a thing. I'm just looking at the, if we step back a wee bit, um, just in your report itself. I'm looking at page 40, 12. Uh, you're suggesting reasons for us being off track. Um, generally, fall into a couple of areas. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, somewhere in there I read, oh, here you go, sub-15. Staff analysis suggests the reasons for not achieving the targets generally fall into the following areas, 15.1. Ambitious targets set by ourselves. Um, and 15.2, results outside our direct control. And 15.3, continuation of a downward tr trend in, for example, public transport numbers particularly interested in 15.1. So when you say ambitious targets set by ourselves, who are ourselves? And then a t talking of the um, analysis that goes into setting the particular target at the time. Um, to cut to the chase, I read ourselves as councillors. Yep. Um, and at the end of the day, even if the targets didn't originate there, they're endorsed by mm -hmm. the council. Um, so in and around that, because so that I can interpret that as saying councillors aren't uh, overly ambitious. Mm. So can you help me through that? <laughs> Are overly ambitious, I think would be the, um, the description. Um, perhaps, Chair, if I, I, I could answer that. Um, so most of those targets were set uh, in a combination of the, in the 2017 strategic plan and the 2018 long-term plan. And the targets were set at the commencement of a range of programmes that were uh, funded for the first time in the long-term plan. So, for example, um, uh, the erosion control scheme uh, was uh, created uh, in 2018 uh, with an ambitious allocation of funding from um, Council, $30 million over 10 years to scale up erosion control. The estimate at that time that Council endorsed and adopted as a performance measure was that we would achieve 2,000 hectares of uh, planting per annum uh, and um, for reasons that we probably uh, don't quite recall and probably um, uh, were, were imprudent at the time, we assumed that we could achieve 2,000 hectares per annum from year one of uh, a 10 year program. Uh, of course, in reality, it took time to stand up the scheme, develop the policies, develop the funding mechanisms, engage landowners, and so it was a, uh, it was a slow ramp up and we're now running at about 900 hectares uh, per annum. And so the original assumptions about both a flat line of, um, of delivery and also the scale of impact we could achieve were overly ambitious, but they were a guesstimate at the time. 
So I guess one of the challenges we always have in setting up new programs is that we want to have performance measures tied to any new program so we can see whether we're delivering the outcomes and see how we're going. But you have to make uh, guesses or estimates at the front end uh, as to um, how much impact you're going to achieve. Uh, and so in these cases we were um, overly ambitious about what we thought we could achieve with the, um, uh, with the resources allocated. So, and colleagues, there is an attachment there, if, if, um, a separate attachment of the report, which is an easier, it's presented in a better format for some reason. But, okay, so there's a number of questions in there. Um, so again, we can't undo the past. Mm -hmm. So how are our target setting plans, procedures, measurements, um, and pathways improved mm -hmm. and more realistic mm -hmm. than they were back when they were set. Yep. And also, the integrity of a document which is one of our plans, mm -hmm. um, it's not a good look for us to have said that stuff which we've told, presented to the public, this is what we intend to do, make us accountable on it. A couple of years later, or a few years later, we're saying, oh, actually, uh, yeah, you know, they were too ambitious or, or, or whatever and then the next bit is so what signals along that path to where we are now were made to the public so when we consulted on the uh, the long-term plan uh, itself uh, in 2018 we did not um, uh, estimate that this was uh, the deliverable uh, that we would achieve through the public consultation that came later what we have done is reviewed all of these measures and targets as a part of developing the 2021 long-term plan and they've been adjusted um, with the benefit of the knowledge of the three-year um, uh, period we've been through. In setting uh, measures for the long-term plan, you are effectively stuck with them for the three-year period. Uh, you can't, unless you do a long-term plan amendment. So this, as uh, Sarah said, was uh, this is reporting on the last year of the three-year cycle. So um, we've, yeah, we've made a whole bunch of adjustments and I think uh, in the development of the 2021 long-term plan we've taken not only what we've learnt through that period but in discussions with councillors we've made changes to our programmes um, to a, a effectively achieve more um, with the resources that we've got. An example again, the erosion control scheme, changing the grant rate um, to spread the money further um, and the level of uptake that we're now receiving gives us um, I guess confidence that the numbers we've put in the 2021 long-term plan for non-financial measures are, are achievable and, and, and will be achieved. I'd say more generally um, the organisation over the last long-term plan period undertook uh, a major step change in funding and in activity. Um, the organisation's grown by about 50% uh, in FTE numbers over that period. Um, a significant um, increase of a similar order of magnitude in terms of um, revenue and expenditure. Uh, and it was it was with a high degree of um, ambition but also uncertainty. And we've learnt a lot about um, uh, scaling up, what it takes in terms of the, um, the development of um, systems and processes, um, so IT systems, financial systems, uh, accommodation uh, and also having staff uh, with the capability and capacity to deliver these programs. Um, so yeah, certainly with the benefit of hindsight, um, we're probably more realistic now about what it takes and that's been part of our um, continued discussion with Council and the development of the 2021 long-term plan is um, we need to be realistic about how much we can achieve and how quickly we can achieve. Um, you can. You can allocate the funding, but having people with the requisite skills uh, on the ground, building on relationships uh, and delivering uh, is, a, is another whole question. So, um, just to read a couple of things you said, um, particularly for our, our new members there, the long-term plan. When I said earlier, James was explaining the context, I said we're a very regulated environment in that we, um, the various plans, particularly the long-term plan, there's a lot of work goes into that. Once that's agreed, signed off, consulted on, accepted, that are the rules of our engagement. That actually prescribes what we do. If we want to go a few dollars over something, it actually almost goes through the CEO. But the general theme of what they are does not change unless we have go through part of that process again. 
It's very, very rigid. So often the flexibility we might like to have, or the public may expect us to have on many issues, by law we can't have it. Um, we might like to, but we can't. So that's why the work that, that's so important, the pre-work that goes into a long-term plan, for example, or the various updates, um, is, is crucial. So the tough question here, James, is knowing that, and knowing we've just gone through a long-term plan, what confidence can everyone have in the various targets, financial and otherwise, in that plan, that they are realistic, that there are uh, resources in place and strategies in place to help deliver them, report on them, uh, to help achieve the outcomes that we've all signed up to? In terms of the things that we can control, um, I think we've we've shifted an awful long way. So um, one of the biggest um, innovations of this long-term plan has been a, um, a consolidated and comprehensive corporate plan. So last time uh, we focused heavily on increasing service delivery at the front line of the organisation with inadequate uh, uh, planning and, and, and resourcing around the corporate backbone of the organisation and that put a lot of strain in the last long term plan period on the organisation um, and we managed to uh, box our way through with some, with some headwinds um, uh, but also um, uh, with some innovation around things like our, our accommodation footprint and, and, and working differently uh, and more flexibly. But it was a challenge, and this long-term plan, we now have a comprehensive uh, uh, corporate plan that has adequate provision for, uh, example, our IT infrastructure to manage the growth in services over the um, the coming period. So we're we're far better planned, and we're far better resourced for the continued growth of the organisation. Although the growth over the next three years. Uh, is more tempered than it was over the last three years, and that's based on a more realistic assessment of those constraints uh, that exist around um, growth, uh, and also the, um, I guess, the ability of the ratepayer uh, to pay. So we've we've made some choices in this long-term plan that are cal calibrated based on. Uh, on, on some of the things that we, we can control. The things we can't control remain uh, of serious concern. Um, COVID being number one, so the tail end of the last long-term plan period, the last um, half of the last long-term plan period was significantly disrupted uh, by COVID in terms of um, delivery and staff also being uh, hauled off into other COVID response uh, related activity. Um, we also uh, were very fortunate in receiving a huge amount of fiscal stimulus from the government that we now need to deliver on, uh, which has added um, uh, additional pressure to the organisation. And then that's all occurring in the context of a very tight labour market, um, some inflationary costs around um, our third party contractors, etc. So those things that we can't control, I guess, which are you know, the, the, the hot labour market uh, presents as a, as a real challenge, us being able to continue to recruit and retain um, the requisite staff to deliver what remains an ambitious uh, programme of delivery uh, and obviously as this committee uh, is aware because we've previously reported on um, we have um, a range of interventions around our workforce in place to try and recruit and retain um, but it's ever a, a challenge in, in the current environment so um, uh, in terms of the, your, your primary question chair about confidence um, I'm confident that we are um, better positioned uh, uh, than we've ever been as an organisation to deliver uh, more impact uh, on the things that Council charges us with delivering. Um, but we also have a highly dynamic external environment that's fraught with some uncertainty. So that lessens the confidence to some extent that we'll necessarily be able to deliver everything on time. Okay, so thank you. Um, in, in my opinion, this is actually a very, very important document because this is the one which we try to gain a keep social licence to do much of what we have, because in my opinion this is how many of our, the public, our ratepayers, observe what we're doing, such as pollution and streams, such as um, consenting times and processes, etc, etc. This is where the rubber hits the real road. Um, we have many, many new systems in place on the financial side, as we discussed earlier, absolutely. When we get to this kind of stuff, it's... Um, I personally think we need to spend a whole lot more time on the realism part of it, but I'll come back to that. I'll just kind of again Mark, go around the table. Any thoughts or comments or observations? Would you like to start, Neil? No, nothing to say. Chair. Nothing to say. Was it leap year? <laughs> Will. <coughs> um, yeah, if I could 
carry on from that point you picked up, Chair, because um, I think it's a really important um, discussion around you know, what we achieve and what we don't. And so a question to James really um, around you know, what you see um, as a measure of success and how you start this and what it looks like at the end. Um, you know, to take for example this report and everything is ticked on track and green. I mean, would that be a good thing in your eyes or I guess what I'm getting to is um, <coughs> when we set these targets, I think ambitious is, is a good thing and it keeps, you know, the, the whole team challenged and, and motivated for that reason. And so is there a risk if we set real realis realistic targets and they're just easily achieved and then kind of everyone just takes their um, foot off the pedal, so to speak? Is, yeah, how do, you, how do you approach it from a leadership point of view? So I, I, I think that risk is, is where we were historically, which was a lot of output reporting, not a lot of outcome reporting. Uh, simply said that you know we'll deliver A, B and C service uh, each year, and each year we delivered what we said we would deliver uh, within a relatively static um, both funding and, and, and delivery environment. The last long-term plan, very deliberately, Council said they wanted to see outcomes and they wanted to see a step change in environmental outcomes across the region. The difficulty with that, of course, is that um, most of the issues we deal with around uh, freshwater, biodiversity, climate change are long-term issues that have um, uh, an awful lot of uh, investment required at the front end before results will be seen over a longer period of time. It's no accident that the measures are tied to horizons like 2040, 2050, those sorts of things, because um, one, that's the time frame that it will take to achieve those outcomes, but also those are the sort of intergenerational, um, I guess, uh, benefits that, that Council uh, is wanting to see us deliver on. So if I had to summarise this annual plan in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a snapshot, I'd say it describes a really long list of, of activities and things that we've delivered, uh, and then it shows how far we've got to go on a whole bunch of the longer term outcomes for the region on some of the most wicked problems that the region faces. So the communication challenge with our community, I guess, is keeping the faith that we're doing the right work to deliver the outcomes over the longer period of time. I like, I'd like to believe that what we are seeing uh, in that activity reporting uh, is really significant partnerships with our communities, rural sector, urban uh, communities. We're seeing a lot of change in, uh, I guess, the buy-in to what we're doing as an organisation, and we're seeing uh, the work that we do with individuals and organisations growing almost exponentially. So we're seeing that the activity and the delivery on the ground is really ramped up. But we know that the cause and effect uh, in terms of you know, water quality, uh, for example, or biodiversity is going to be a long run game. And so the, you know, we're going to have to continue to communicate with the community about the realism of the challenge, the scale of the challenge, the time it's going to take, uh, but that every step is contributing to those <coughs> outcomes uh, over time. Does that answer? Question. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is, from my point of view, I'm quite happy with the ambitious, and if we don't hit them as long as we're trending that, in that direction and yeah. still achieving what you know what we realistically can within the organisation, I'm quite comfortable with that. Mm. Look, we were, we were. I think we we, we were clearly asked to come up with stretch goals. Um, Council wanted to see us be ambitious, uh, so that's what what we've done, and, and we'll 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 constantly be making progress towards but not quite getting there if we have stretchy goals. Um, and I, I think given the scale of the issues that this organisation is responsible for in a statutory sense, it is appropriate that they are stretch goals. Mm, and I think um, it's fair to say our colleagues around the council table are very ambitious on an environmental sense and reflect in the priorities that we have in our long term plan and fully appreciate. But the, the key is and, and, and sorry, Jack, I'll come to you in a sec. But for example, I think this must be the other long-term plan, one that's off track. By 2050, there will be an improving trend in life-supporting capacity of all the region's degraders, degraded rivers and major streams. It's currently off track. Mm. Now, I think that's absurd, because how do you know? Mm. Even if you said it was on track, how do you know? Mm. What I'm interested in is where do you expect it to be about 2040, 2030, 2025, mm. and if it's been in play for a few years, mm. that... Right now, it may be on, on track, but it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's further to that other point we had 
discussions earlier, it's the, okay, stretch target, what's real? We could put climate neutral by 2050 in there, where are we today, where do we need to be, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, I'm just going to jump in there. There's just another one, which is a real bugbear of mine. On track, by 2025, stock is excluded from all round all year round flowing streams and rivers at least 30 per cent are fenced and planted to filter contaminants. Okay, on track and you know I'm, I'm very staunch on my views on that but then as I said earlier social licenses all st most by and large most streams are fenced urban and rural where possible under various arrangements it's happening but then we give ourselves an out and because stock in the most of the public eyes is uh, animals, mm -hmm. um, which leave behind a bit of a mess occasionally, um, but here we reference the RMA and the national standard, which actually is only cattle, pigs and deer yep. are prohibited from accessing wetlands and lakes by 2023, mm -hmm. yeah, our target is 2025, so A, anything other than those three animals therefore are kind of tacitly okay in our wetlands. Mm -hmm by that measure there, that cannot be right, and most public would agree with that, I think. And then the reconciliation, that has been used as a 2023 target uh, test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the target's 2025, so they need to be reconciled. So just park that, um, but as we, I'll go through my colleagues again, and, and we might just have another look at that. Jacqueline, your thoughts, please. Um, yeah, so just following on from what Will said about those ambitious targets, and going back to that, erosion control scheme. So you had uh, 2,000 hectares of land cover and you got 1,274 hectares covered. And excuse me, I apologise in advance because I've still got a lot of reading to do with long-term plans but to catch up. But um, what have you set for a target going forward from this point? Are you still remaining at that 2,000 hectare or have you lowered that? We've lowered to 900 per annum. Oh yeah, you did say that. But okay. Even though you achieved 1,274? So 1,274 was over the three year period. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we, we've hit, you know, I think in the last year it was 896 or something like that. So, so we, we've, we've set a target that we think we can sustain okay. uh, over, over you know, each year of the coming, upcoming long term plan. Mm. I yep. think I'm just really sitting on the bench with Will a little bit as well as really, I mean, look, you've thought it through and I trust you on that part. Um, it's just really that you just don't want, you know, it's sustainable, but are we just taking it, you know, taking it easy and just so we look good on paper. Mm. But I, but I, you know, I do like ambitious as well because it keeps people moving forward, but you've got that long-term plan and sustainability thought of, so that's good. That's all from me. Thanks, Jacqueline. Stephanie. Yeah, nothing further for me on that one. OK, all right. We, we haven't heard this. Mm. Any, have you any comments and thoughts? No, I'll, I'll come back while our, our CEO and... Yeah, I, I, and I, I, for, for me, who um, who looks at these on a quarterly basis and I look through our staff comments as well as making sure it's very transparent about how, how we are reporting um, and interrogating where it needs to be to make sure it's understood. Um, as I say, I think we went through... A, very robust process when we set the next long-term plan to look at those measures um, with all of that in mind as well. So I um, welcome any feedback as well. So when I'm doing these quarterly reports on our long-term plan and our level of service measures um, and when it comes to the annual um, plan with the community outcome measures as well, um, I've got a very good understanding of what you expect and to make sure it reflects that. Um, uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I just want to say something else. Um, you know, don't want to be negative, and I get credit, gave credit to the finance system that's improved before. But I also do want to just note that, you know, I, I also want to say there's a credit to the team as well for seeing the green. I like seeing the green as well, and so too all the rate payers. So, um, well done. Do you want to wrap up anything you don't? Um, look, Chair, the. In terms of the environmental measures, because that's largely uh, where we are uh, off track or there might be some question marks about delivery, particularly in the longer term, um, the measures were uh, all designed with a uh, an overarching strategy for Council of having a mix of regulatory and non-regulatory interventions. So using the 
full tools available under the Resource Management Act as well as um, incentives and um, I guess um, uh, schemes that support landowners to do the right thing as well as our own uh, activities uh, on the ground. At the moment where we stand, the regulatory piece has still got a long way to go and that goes back to Kotahi and the freshwater plan changes that, that we need. Uh, until we get regulations uh, more universally across the region that are similar to what we have in Tuki Tuki around managing high risk activities, uh, requiring uh, stock exclusion, managing things like nitrogen, phosphorus, etc., um, we can't be all that confident that we are going to deliver these outcomes. Um, but we are required by law to have those regulations at least notified by the end of 2024. So this new long-term plan uh, period that we've just embarked on is now the big phase to essentially set the regulations alongside a big program of non-regulatory work that we're doing on the ground. If that all comes together, then I think we can have more confidence that some of those longer-term uh, measures will be delivered. And just finally, Chair, on the stock exclusion uh, issue, it has been determined at the national level that sheep uh, don't need to be excluded from um, our waterways. Um, I've got some personal um, questions about that position, but while that is the national regulatory position, we couldn't meet the targets in this plan if, if uh, the definition was to include uh, sheep. So at the moment the regulations really, as you've noted, only relate to, um, to cattle, deer and pigs. Um, and if the community expectation is that it does include uh, sheep, then uh, we're going to have to um, revisit that through the Kotahi process, uh, and that will be a really challenging conversation um, with our hill country farming community, um, uh, given the national regulatory settings. Sure, and, and just to clarify, I'm particularly interested in the urban streams, not the rural, because I, I'm very sympathetic to that. And I hear what you're saying, and the point there about the floor our floor is what's required from rules, regulations, standards, RMA, whatever, for money, no worries at all. Social licence is um, if, 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 if animals are grazing near streams which we or our fellow local governments in Hawke's Bay are responsible for, to me that's not right given we don't expect that to happen anywhere else and we should not be party to it regardless of the cost of lawnmowers, I think. Um, Neil, having heard that, did, did, are you still okay? You are comfortable with where we've landed on the non-financial? That, that just discussion? fine, thanks, Chair. Okay, That's cheers. Brilliant. All right. Well, thanks very much. That and uh, there, there's that. Uh, uh, I guess also, to be fair, these targets are set by council lose the council table. Um, I think a perhaps a weakness on our part is the strategy sessions, particular to the stretch goals that we have and exploring and testing those amongst councillors to assist yourselves in the pragmatism and the pathways to those goals. Um, that can be tough, but once you get that, we get that out the way, everything becomes much easier and hopefully. As, as CEO said, that's reflected in our new LTP. Okay, uh, what are we doing? We're receiving that off again. Oops. We're just receiving a noting, are we? Yes. Mm -hmm. Recommendations there, so um, I'll, I'll move that they'll receive notice and the recommendations as written. Will, yep. second that, thank you. Okay, that's done. So just, just noting this, we'll all come back, obviously, once it's been through audit uh, for adoption at the later meeting. We'll come here or go to Neil's committee? It's going to both. Um, it's going back to FARS again and CNS, the final. Um, okay. Just, just this precursor to the paper f next time. It's not going to CNS, I think it's just going to FARS. Just going to FARS, is it? Yes. The just final here. report. Yes. yes. Okay. Just to FARS and then to council. Right, and straight through to council. So on your cover note then, when we get there, can you just have, hey, this has changed since we saw it last, and that's what we'll try and concentrate on. We've had our chance to give it a bit of a going over now. Okay, what have we got next? Is that the road safe? Item 17A, who's speaking to that? So, Mary Ann Baker's here. Um, I'm not sure where Katie, Katie Nimmin is today, but Mary Ann uh, was involved with commissioning this, so she can answer any specific questions. I, I could just introduce it. Uh, in the last item on the uh, non financials in the draft annual report, you will have seen that we have persistently high uh, levels of. Um, uh, serious injury and fatality occurring uh, in the um, uh, transport environment in the region and so our road safety program isn't achieving 
the objectives that we have set for it, which is a uh, is an ongoing reduction in um, uh, harm as associated with uh, with with road use. So um, the Road Safe program is currently um, funded uh, in part, uh, actually by majority, by Walker. Kotahi, um, central government, um, and delivered by two staff members uh, within uh, the regional council. Uh, it's done in collaboration with New Zealand Police, um, Waka Kotahi, and the territorial authorities. Um, and it has been um, sitting, well, it does sit under the auspices of the Regional Transport Committee. Um, the Regional Transport Committee has um, asked some probing questions in recent times about the effectiveness and efficiency of the, um, the current service. And uh, so um, staff consider it timely that we undertake a Section 17A review of that service um, to look at really whether there are uh, better delivery models or whether we could achieve um, uh, better outcomes from the delivery of the service um, than is currently the case. Marianne, is there other context that you want to um, provide? Well, perhaps just to note that we are not really meeting targets for um, our road safe and that our business as usual approach obviously wasn't working. So this is an opportunity to explore other ways of improving the integration of the road safe um, delivery alongside infrastructure management and other um, enforcement um, opportunities and a more integrated approach. Can, can you describe what road safe is not? Well, I don't, I don't, sorry, it's not meant to testing. So what, what are we talking about here? And the reason was I mentioned this to Councillor Williams yesterday, who's the chair, chair of the Transport Committee, and I am going to suggest that we just touch base with him and any thoughts he might have on this, because um, they have explored parts of this themselves, and there's no point of dupe or triplicating here. So, and, and, so just road safe, well, easier question, what is road safe? It's a component of the road to zero strategy, essentially, that um, in, in ensuring we have a safe transport system, part of the burden falls on drivers and users of the transport system to understand the risks and to take responsibility for how they use the transport system. Um, it includes managing the transport system itself so that it is safe for users. So there's an infrastructure element um, and includes um, aspects like vehicle safety, which isn't something we manage, that's managed nationally, and enforcement, so making sure that people follow rules that are set in place for... But this is not us. about the, the patronage on buses, for example, no. but once they're on buses, is it safe? Um, oh, well, buses, safe. buses need to have a safe network on which to operate. Sure, that's why I asked what it's not yeah. including. Is that about right, James? I'm just trying to keep it quite no, narrow here because that's, that's what these right. are supposed it, to be. It, it, it largely relates to um, our public education and it relates to targeted public education. So it's not the uh, telev television advertising that New Zealand Police or Waka Kotahi will do around road safety. Uh, but it is... Um, uh, so, so, for example, the program runs a annual uh, uh, road safety expo, which every high school student... Uh, in the region at some point goes through and there's a whole bunch of education around that. Um, there's work with targeted communities around um, uh, child restraints. Child restraints. Um, the fatigue stops and yeah. safety stops with truck drivers, um, reaching out with um, employers to make sure their, their employees are driving safely. So it's, it's all non-enforcement, non-regulatory and non-infrastructure related community engagement. Mm. The brutal truth on the road toll being two thirds of it is no seat belts, very excessive speed, drink or drugs. Um, would you believe about a third of motorbike accident fatalities are no helmets? Um, and, and along those lines, so that's about 300 funerals a year that don't need to happen. Um, anyway, so, so th thanks for that. Um, I'll start the other end. Stephanie, any thoughts on this? I realise it's all new to it, but mm. the reason I ask you. So, so, can you just describe a Section 17A again? I know we touched on it, but just from the CEO's perspective, which is very important here, is what's not up for review discussion at this moment? So, council is required under the um, Local Government Act to uh, at least every six years review uh, each and every service uh, it delivers. 
uh, to ensure that it's uh, appropriately delivering on the outcomes set out for it uh, and that uh, it's reviewed the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of the, uh, the way in which the, the service is being delivered. Uh, so this one um, hasn't been reviewed for some time and, um, and for all the reasons that have been discussed, uh, it seems like a prime candidate right now to, to undertake that review. No, look, I, I didn't have any particular questions. It'll be interesting to see the results of the review. I presume we see that, do we? Yes, it yep. will come back to this committee. No, nothing else for me. No, nothing for me. Will, rural expects driver's licensing? No. I'll move the recommendations. Just before we do that, are you are the rest of the uh, committee comfortable that, so this is passed, um, we just invite Martin... Martin uh, Williams, just to give them knowledge that this is going on and he may have input along the way as they're doing their review or any thoughts? Who comes with that? CNS has got that opportunity there. Oh, true, true. Okay. So you've moved in those recommendations? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, you'll be seconding those. Thanks very much. That is passed. Thanks, everyone. Right, we're now up to risk maturity. Up. Sorry, Chair, just before we move on, I was very rude and I didn't introduce um, Mary Ann Baker, who is a uh, senior planner in, the, oh, um, in our policy and planning team, uh, who was the acting manager of our transport team for about the last 12 months uh, while we were. Um, Happy to hand that over to our new transport manager, Katie Nimmin. So. Yes, has she started? She has started. She started, she started last yep. week. Oh, yeah, please pass on my regards to her. Catching up with a big list of jobs for her to introduce. There's a big list. <laughs> <laughs> yes, You're in tray, isn't it? Yeah, fair enough. Excellent. Thanks, Marianne. OK, thank you. Appreciate that. OK, risk maturity update item seven, I think, on our agenda, or at least my written one. Mm -hmm. Helen and Olivia. <coughs> right. <coughs> Okay, so the floor's yours. If you go, introduce sometimes yourself it's quick, and Olivia. Sometimes. Yes, sure. Um, I'll let Olivia introduce herself, but I'm Helen Marsden. I'm the Risk and Corporate Compliance Manager. Um, report through to Jess. Um, so, pretty much take responsibility for risk maturity in the business at the moment. Yeah. And I'm Olivia Giraud Burrell. I'm the business analyst for Quality. So, currently maintaining the QMS system. And internal audit. <laughs> Great, thank you. And um, yeah, very few of us are excited about this stuff. I'm one of them. <laughs> a few others, tragics in this room, I think. So, we'll talk us through the report, what we've got here, highlights. Sure. And also the awkward question we should ask you and maybe haven't yet. Okay. Um, now, first of all, before I start, there is a, a small correction in the paper which has a significance in meaning. <laughs> um, on, in paragraph nine, I've noted, uh, I think it's paragraph nine, mm. um, I note that it says each great group manager has dedicated, it should be point 0.1 of an FTE rather than <laughs> 10. <laughs> FTEs, yeah. So, um, yes, a, a small typo with a <laughs> rather significant uh, meaning, but... Um, okay, thanks. Not enough getting point one. Yes. <laughs> point one. Point one. Point one. My team is growing. What's the total of that, though? Is point one, you've got ten of them, have you? Uh, you've got one, one FTE is, or something? Um, half a person per week from each group manager. Which adds up to how many persons? <sighs> oh, gosh, I haven't actually done the figures. Yeah. But you'll be close to one. It won't quite be one. Yeah. Close to one FTE. Close, close to one. Okay, yeah. thanks. FTA, yeah, yeah. Close to one FTE. Um... So I think at the last meeting um, uh, we agreed that um, we would review the risk maturity project plan as it stood against the risk maturity roadmap which was approved um, over a year ago by um, the Corporate and Strategic Committee. Um, I think we did the review, um, it was very timely for that review to happen because we were coming to the end of phases one to three which was really about establishing content um, and, and reframing the risks at a more of a governance level. Um, and phase four is really about now, I call that where the rubber hits the road, where we're actually taking uh, that content and developing to risk processes that, that we will drive into the business. Um, 
So essentially this paper outlines a couple of things that we still need to do to completely close out um, phases one to three. Um, I'll take responsibility for that between now and Christmas. Um, and then uh, really uh, looking at the design of the project plan to make sure it was right sized for phase four. We're actually rewriting that project plan now to make sure that it is the right fit. Um, the proposal is that we now split that project plan into two components, one looking at more the, um, I guess, formalising so a lot of a lot of the, uh, I guess, risk processes within the strategy and the um, strategic project piece is already there. It's just formalising that and, and me working with that team um, that doesn't really require the risk champion. That will be me and that team working together to make sure uh, we, we, we develop that. Um, and then the second piece is um, probably the more significant piece and that is actually looking at um, how we actually now take the um, that content of the that we've developed, develop it into those risk processes and embed that into the business. And so that'll take a kind of two-pronged approach as well. It's actually making sure we've got the right risk attitude and understanding of the staff and also really developing those um, systematic processes, I guess. Um, doing that will also enable a better oversight for us to actually do better risk aggregation and sort of a little bit more challenge into the risk reporting that comes through to this table once every six months. Um, it was really pleasing. We did have a few, quite a few discussions with the executive leadership team, and um, there's a real good commitment from everyone in that team. And we acknowledged that um, you know it is quite extenuating circumstances, and staff are quite tapped out. And there is a commitment of point one of an FTE uh, to actually start developing this um, we can also acknowledge the benefits that this will provide as it goes rolls into the business <coughs> um, so yeah I think that's pretty much the do you have anything else to add Jess in terms of um, no just I suppose just yeah adding to Helen's comments that um, probably has taken a little longer to embed um, the framework into the organisation than we had anticipated. Um, competing priorities across the organisation, I think, um, have sort of amplified um, some of those challenges around, um, with, you know, there are lots of change um, processes um, and transformation changes happening across the organisation from sort of through systems, through technology, um, through, um, yeah, um, turnover, um, I think all of those changes and the competing priorities um, make change challenging um, and making sure that we I think get the pace of change right um, is really important. So showing the benefits um, in ways I think that um, so we the change is adopted and not forced upon people is really important. So we don't want Helen's team to be seen as sort of just another layer of compliance, um, sort of coming in at the back end and sort of being a tick box exercise. We want to be able to make sure that we can demonstrate where the, where the real benefits are and I think that Helen's been doing that through pockets of the organisation um, so she sort of can identify where she can go and work with people to identify where controls can be put in place or um, just parts of the organisation where um, she can sort of zoom in and help um, pockets of people um, identify where we can really um, I suppose prioritise spend um, or um, identifying where those controls can make the biggest difference um, has really made quite a big difference um, in seeing where, where we can prioritise the effort. Um, so that's sort of the approach that we're trying to take to um, capitalise, I suppose, on the ad early adopters. So um, okay. slow and steady, I think, is the as the approach at the moment. Yeah, and you raise a good point. We can't go, we've got to bring everyone with us. It's a cultural issue there. And uh, so that's, 
you can't put a time frame around that other than we have time frames around this. Um, so, so just those, the old bow ties, which is just such a final door to go through. How many you got left to do? Uh, there's only three. So there's, uh, most there's still actually, only three, because it was three the, last meetings. So some of them are in, in train, so in progress, it's actually okay. refining those to um, make sure there's good agreement around the um, people that take responsibility. It's a big deal once we complete those, because we do move to a new stage, mm. don't we, of, of, of hopefully becoming part of the cultural furniture of the organisation. They're a very important component to, to test our completeness of our critical controls or make sure we've we've got them all in good oversight of those. That, that's so, right. Yeah. And, and, and just your point about uh, show, oh, sorry, it might have been yours, Helen, uh, showing the benefits, having buy-in, um, I'd be brave enough to say that would be really helpful at council table as well, to so, say, hey, because of this hard work we did earlier, we've managed to um, uh, de-risk some issues. That could be flooding issues in Napier, that could be biosecurity, TB outbreaks, our awareness of the way we manage it, etc. Just, just some of those examples that I think we've discussed in the past would be really helpful. And the honest bit is we can't stop rain, but how this organisation manages big events, we can consider it. Okay, oh, Stephanie, um, I'll pass this one to you just to have a look at or any comments at all, if you like. Um, over to you. Thank you. I just had a uh, query around moving into that phase four um, Era, I guess, and um, and it seems to me a lot of the implementation comes down to, to people. It, it's it's how you get it in terms of the culture, job scope, people's performance, and so forth. So I'm interested to know to what extent you're involving HR in your um, implementation through that phase four stage. So in terms of um, looking at how people are behaving and. In the culture, the yeah, well, I, side. I, I think um, I think there's a there's potentially a lot of um, a lot of the practical work um, can can be done with HR assistance because it um, you know it's it's job descriptions, it's um, factors in performance reviews, remuneration and benefits, culture change management, all that all that sort of piece. So I'm just interested to know is there an overlap between the the work that that you guys are doing are within risk and compliance and uh, and your colleagues and in your human resources area. Yes, um, yes, absolutely. And um, I think um, we too we are cur currently kind of considering sort of what it means around integrated management systems. So some of those um, activities like um, competency frameworks or something like that, and how they play across those um, different management systems. So that would be led by um, HR or people at either PNC, and we would um, dovetail off that, I guess, from a risk perspective. So um, definitely it's, uh, it would be where the touch points are dealing with other areas, we would um, lead from their expertise. That's the only thing. Noting we had a, a report from Crow Health uh, in this space recently, so, so there's a bit of a body of internal knowledge and direction to rest upon as, as we reference the, the points that you're raising. All good? Jack, well in. Not really, but I'm really dishing out the credits today. I think it's um, excellent development and work um, to, to identify all those risks and a plan to what to do in case of. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to see how it rolls out with all teams. Thanks. Will? Um, not really any questions, but yeah, good to see the progress and the, um, the step with the, um, bringing the exec team in and the commitment from them sounds promising. So, yeah, it's um, good progress. Good to hear. Neil? No comment. All good. Okay. Yeah. So great stuff all round. Um, as always, I'm impatient where it is. Absolutely understand some of the reasons why we are where we are. Um, and funnily enough, that points to a key risk to this organisation of some uh, some personnel uh, in areas of which much depends, um, and uh, uh, our ability to deliver on so many things depends on our ability to 
retain staff, attract staff, or, or make sure we have the best environment possible for staff. So uh, again, kind of a bit of a parallel piece of work going in, space in place there um, for those things that we can control. Well, if no other further comment then on, on that one, okay, then can I, um, who would like to move those, recommend, Jackie, you can't, can you? Will, can you um, move those? Yeah, happy to move Please, Steph Stephanie, can you second those? Thanks very much, um, as written there. Fantastic, that's passed. Right, what are we on to now? We are on to, on my, at least my one, annual enterprise internal audit plan. Yes. Are you doing that? Yeah. So you, to be audited, are deciding what we should audit? <laughs> no, so <laughs> definitely, yeah. Uh, There's a cast. Definitely not. There's an initial definitely. first blow before the whistle. <laughs> um, so I guess this was actually deferred from the last meeting, the annual audit plan um, so obviously this is only a recommendation it is um, for the purposes of this um, committee this um, internal audit plan um, we have had input from Crow into developing this and looked at um, previous um, internal audits from that audit universe that have been undertaken um, and I guess most importantly for this particular recommendation is that we have considered um, the availability of internal resources at this point in time with some of the business disruption that the organisation has been faced with and still trying to deliver on uh, individual objectives. Um, so the recommendation uh, is that um, we undertake a review around our fraud management framework. They thought that was quite timely with um, making sure that what we have in place leverages off um, the strengthening of our financial system through Tech One, um, and just test our uh, our risk management strategies and policies. Um, and the other one is just the cyclical audit around data analytics that occurs every year. Um, so yeah, so that's the okay. Thank, recommendation. Thank you. This did go through ELT as well and has their endorsement as well. Yeah, I see that, and that's great. So it's context again is traditionally we've actually done up to four of these. Um, and we, we kept one up our sleeve for last financial year, I think, um, and as, that was fortuitous as events folded given all the stresses and strains yes. in the organisation. Um, and then I see this paper and we've grabbed that and gone down to two. Um, so I understand what you're saying and your point about um, we're stressed and stress, stressed at the moment, resource-wise, time-wise, whatever. Absolutely understand that audit's always a hassle, but they're actually a necessary hassle. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic. Um, um, would have kind of would have been good to have a bit more of a discussion about this one before it arrived here. Um, maybe not yourself, but maybe my catch up with um, the leadership team, because uh, there are issues presenting to us as an organisation right now that have a lot of risk. Um, for example, well, the point there about fraud management framework, absolutely right, but our earlier discussions were, well, once Fuse slash Tech One's in place, it's done an audit on itself anyway by implementing it and, and reconciling everything under the new system, so that's cool. So it's kind of an audit of the implementation with a bonus of a financial one. So. Um, Crow, whoever does that one, that will be pretty easy. But again, there's these other th issues which I would like us to. I'm, I'm comfortable with the recommendation. I'm just would like to discuss further with the committee here, um, not necessarily at this meeting. If there's other issues which they feel necessary that we would like to have a look at, in my head, uh, they're actually not financial. They they line up with some of the other discussions we had earlier in the day. That just that's just my part. I'll start with uh, yourself, Will. Have you got any thoughts around this? Um, no, not, not at the okay. moment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. uh, Jacqueline, no. a bit hard because you're brand new to this. <laughs> um, okay. No, Stephanie. Yeah. Look, I had a, a related query to to your point. Um, picking up, for example, on the the health and safety and well-being audit, last one done 2018-19, you know, if, that, if that's not going to be done this year or you know, maybe next year, what else happens? What other checks and balances are there? And perhaps not just for health and safety, although that was the one that sprung to mind for me. 
Um, I guess some context to this, and I'm not sure if I made it clear enough in the paper, is that we do have within each of those sort of management systems where there, there, there is significant risk, we do have, we undertake operational audits on a regular basis. So if those operational audits um, highlight anything that's um, of a high finding, we will bring that through the risk reporting and to this table. Um, and there's actually within the framework a um, the risk framework and escalation channel that if it's really important it would go through to um, the CE and then through to the chair if it's of material importance. So um, I guess that's, there is a n number of other operational, which we call operational audits, undertaken within the business through the quality management system and through the health and safety system, etc. So um, these are just really more the high level audits and the system type audits themselves. So, yeah. But the beauty being uh, outside party comes in with their wisdom and unencumbered in any way and has a look and that's always helpful um, in, many as in addition to the various uh, audit type things that are going on in the table you've got at the end there which is very very helpful thank you. So, Chair, sorry, oh, sorry. Chair, can I just make an additional comment on in relation particularly to health and safety and wellbeing but also the people and capability piece um, noted in there of course is the talent management uh, audit that we did uh, last year. I think Next year, um, will be it will be probably timely to do a further uh, uh, audit of our entire uh, people and capability management system, including the health and safety and wellbeing. Over the last three years or thereabouts, we've gone on a significant journey as an organisation from having um, an HR team of one and an external contractor for health and safety to now an HR team of uh, five plus um, we're moving to three health and safety advisors. Partly that reflects a significant growth in the size of the organisation but also the significant uh, uh, increase in focus on health and safety and wellbeing, talent management, recruitment, uh, learning and development, those um, essential components. So we've been, we've been responding to the previous audits, we've been building up a new capability. There was about a 12 month a period of disruption, partly related to COVID, partly related to some personnel issues. We're now really well locked and loaded uh, in terms of uh, that team and its capability and it's really putting in place the policies uh, and the recommendations that have previously come forward. And I think about um, next financial year we'll be in a good position to take stock of whether we've really delivered on everything that's previously been recommended and whether we're really hitting our straps on that. So, um, yeah, I, obviously today's not the day to decide next year's work program, um, but just seed that thought now that I think at that point it'll be timely to, to look harder at that. Yeah, so, so you know, another way of turning all that on its head is there's three audits we couldn't have done at parts of this organisation which we haven't done. We have to make, you know, by, let's say we accept the total findings of this one. Mm -hmm. Not doing two this year, not one, one this year. It doesn't mean we should always do four or six or seven or one. It just means that's quite a deliberate decision. Let's pass to Neil. Yeah, uh, just... To... Oh, sorry, Stephanie. Sorry, Neil. You, you have finished? Yeah, yeah no, sorry, Neil. Yeah. yeah, just a um, uh, question around Tech One, uh, doing an audit in Tech One when it's so early in, in the day, uh, and I would have assumed, assumed that Tech One had its own quality assurance rollout and implementation process on its own, uh, it, are we doubling up here, and I'm and mindful of the pressure we're putting staff on, do we actually need to do this this year on Tech One, should we kick it out of here uh, as a sufficient oversight or quality management or assurance around Tech One without having to do this audit? Uh, regarding the fraud? Well, it, it, it occurred, I mean, for the, the, the rationale I'm reading at 5.1 is that uh, we've got a new system, Tech One. Uh, we want to examine fraud uh, against it. Um, I'm not convinced that we're sufficiently uh, vetted to tell you much in any event. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, the quality assurance framework for the rollout of Tech One should be sufficient to satisfy ourselves in. Uh, in, in FY22 that it's sufficient uh, should we kick for touch and say let's push it out a year and have a general fraud uh, uh, audit as opposed to one um, 
focused on tech one. Yeah, well, do you know what timing? Do you know when, when, what part of the calendar year? No, we haven't put to do that. Uh, I'd say it's probably at least of quarter three. I imagine three. we'll probably do that. Um, I, we certainly yeah, wouldn't be, I, I, the team wouldn't be ready. We, we, to in have a prior an meeting, we had now. a discussion a with a thing. former member, and it was along the lines of let's have that bedded in. So, no doubt you'd do a, t a techie kind of review of the implementation or the techie mm -hmm. stuff, and for it to have been in for maybe a financial year um, or thereabouts to utilise and leverage off it. I do recall that discussion. So, one financial year is actually. Uh, lot further out than even the third quarter. And then on top of that, you've got your data analytics, which tells you stuff. Anyway. So, yeah, so the yes. data analytic, yeah. analytics is really useful for picking up things like duplicate payments and making sure that you haven't got, um, yeah, and checking your payroll, um, all of your payments and your transactions through your accounts payable, making sure you haven't got um, mm. bank accounts. And so, um, I, it would, is there any, um, any um, if you like, similar? Uh, thought that uh, we're over egging this by doing uh, a tech, well, that, that particular fraud order of that nature now, are we better to either kick for touch, not do it, take some pressure off um, a new, newly evolving finance team and push it out of here? Chair, can I just, just check that we're on the right, we're on the same page about what's being proposed here because I, I might have this wrong as well. I understood that the, 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 the fraud audit would be, um, it's not a deep dive into any of our actual financial data and it's not looking for fraud. Mm -hmm. um, the data analytics obviously does that and that's the annual process that we go through. This is really just to look at the systems uh, decision rights, the, the this process steps that are employed in our financial management system to ensure that it's fit for purpose for fraud uh, detection and avoidance. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's relatively light touch on the finance team, yes, but yeah. I do want so to just I think check. it is, it's more around the settings and the financial delegations and the, the processes that are in place around um, payment approvals and that sort of thing, as opposed to the team themselves and around the processes and their day-to-day. -day, um, so so can you therefore help me out with um, uh, the tech one uh, internal uh, quality assurance? It'll have one. I'm sure. Tech so I one think has the its tech own. one, the processes and the system itself, the quality assurance around how the system's actually working, much of that will be um, assessed through the year end audit um, and how that's actually. Um, so, so the the like the financial audit. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So the audit New Zealand. Sure. That'll audit. that'll tell you how that's. Yeah, operating. that'll they'll yeah. effectively assess how that's operating, <laughs> um, and we'll get a fair idea through next year's audit through the twenty. 223 yeah. audit. Yeah, that, it's sort of that, that to me almost um, we're doubling down on a double down. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether we risk much by not doing it now. We rely on our other instruments to, to help us satisfy ourselves. And in fact, I'm wondering whether in fact we, we ought to invest in another audit, if not this, um, maybe more productive. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll I'm just throw, throw this out as, as, a, as an observation, and it might it, it might be uh, it might be unfair, but it, in in setting in implementing Tech One, we have re-engineered a whole bunch of the internal processes around uh, 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 procuring services, um, uh, financial approvals in relation to those. They've got different process steps and a different user interface now, um, and a different back end for the finance system than we had previously that could present an opportunity for somebody to exploit those changes um, sure. to undertake fraud um, because we have not yet had an independent review of the, the new processes that have been employed. Having said that, we have implemented the new processes with a particular eye to avoiding financial risk to the organisation. So there are there are better checks and balances with the Tech One system than we had previously and we now have pre-approvals required for uh, requisitions and the like than, than, we, than we had previously. So it's a much tighter system than it was, but it's a change system, so it may create some windows. 
So it's probably useful at the at the start of this journey with Tech One to just assure ourselves that it, that it is. But look, I take your point, Neil, that obviously with a lot of pressure on the finance team, there's been a lot of pressure and ongoing pressure around the rollout of Tech One, and I think we just need an assurance, particularly from Jess, that you're comfortable that this is not, you know, going to add mm. um, insult to injury to a to team that's you know been under a, a lot of pressure. Yeah. I'm sorry, and just before going, but a lot of what you've described and even here is kind of business as usual as you've implemented a new system, but of which we can utilise to do an audit around. But the, you know, at the descriptions there, are you're just making sure it's doing what it's supposed to do and there's no holes. You do that regardless of the audit. Anyway, and we're relatively comfortable BAU. that this particular audit, the fraud audit, actually won't involve a lot of day-to-day -day time of the finance team okay. themselves. It's but more just, kind whatever, of the management whatever, whatever, team. Whatever. I mean, the, my point is, can we take pressure off? You're saying it's not, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, though. And I think we Appreciate should it. we can reassess maybe in the next quarter, and if we think that it is actually going to involve a lot of their day-to-day -day time, then perhaps we can reassess and push it out. Okay. And some of these things are touched on in the uh, the audit of the audits, actually, the annual enterprise uh, paper coming up later. There's some of these bits and pieces I've touched on. So, well, we seem uh, pretty comfortable with that thus far, um, and that clarification there. It is jokes aside, asking you what you want audited, but the impost on the team we're very very cognizant of, of all of that so uh, I suggest you just keep us abreast if there are changes in that point space because we can we agree to do it the timing of it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, well at the moment it's just my next financial year but it's That's we, yeah. you've heard this discussion we're open to that um, which goes to my point I guess that those non-financial oh, items I'm very interested in. So what I'd like to do is actually pick up your recommendations but just have them open because I'd just like to contemplate a bit further some other items that I'd like to discuss that we, not here, not today, that we keep open but for potentially another internal audit. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, so Leanne, it says here, item three, mm. uh, approves the uh, annual internal audit plan is proposed. Can you just adjust that so it incorporates <coughs> what's in the paper? But actually we do, um, uh, we note that um, we have potential for up to two more audits um, and we'll discuss those at a later date. I just don't want to... Uh, we will include Not those in the status report like we had last time as Correct. retained capacity. And our yes. recommendations? Good idea. Sorry, yep. it's, it's, a, it's a card we have to keep on the table. Sorry, have you got that, Leanne? So number three, approves the 2021 Annual Enterprise Audit Plan um, as proposed. Um, Can I suggest with, uh, re while retaining the ability for the addition yep. of internal audits as appropriate? Or well, as, as this committee may decide. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Comfortable with that? Great. You okay there, James, on this? Okay. All right, so I'll move those recommendations then with that minor change there to number three. Uh, Will, thank you for seconding that. Let's move on. Where are we up to now? Internal assurance, oh, funny enough, internal assurance dashboard, is that you again? Um, I'll hand over to Livia to um, take the committee through that. Okay, thanks. Um, it's almost a standing item and I'm just wondering as we go through, it's kind of a good thing to have almost up front so we're not, we're not triplicating the discussion because there's some things in here which, which give us a lot of comfort to the other discussions, I think. But anyway, over to you. Good morning, thank you. Um, as you can see, you've got um, the Corrective Actions dashboard attached to the paper. Um, it is deemed as red. Um, I don't know if you want to go through the ones that you want to have comments on. We have um, a separate paper to discuss cyber. Yep. Uh, this is to do with risk management maturity. And as you can see there, we've got three still behind, but we've re baselined due to them leaving and coming back. And <laughs> so we've got some new dates to make sure that we've now got two on track. So we've got four actually behind. Who's got the phone guard? It's mine, sorry. Right, <laughs> right so that'll be a flat white. <laughs> <laughs>
It is on silent, but it buzzes so rather loudly. It certainly wasn't silent. <laughs> OK. Apologies. Go so through the behind Sorry, ones. Olivia, yep. Yeah. We got a bit distracted there from that noise. Keep going. OK, so we've got the three, four behind in the risk management maturity and two on track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To go through one by one? Well, no, that's just the reason I'm kind of saying some of this we've kind of yeah. touched on and discussed. Yeah, yeah. we've covered those. Covered and yeah. the, it's not really into, we don't want to talk yeah. with you. Go through it's, that. It's, okay. We've acknowledged some of these issues. So the second one we'd move on to would be the COVID-19 um, response debrief report. Yeah. Um, that is now um, closed. If you would accept that one that we're recommending to be closed down now. Uh, yes, just tell me what we've received though. So that to close that, what does that actually mean? Have we received something in, in that? So basically there are actions that, were, that came out from the debrief, um, which was to um, ensure that the way communication was done in the COVID um, first lockdown is captured um, so that we use it the same way next time. So these were management actions that management That's have closed right. out. Councillor Curtin had a particular interest in that, I think, didn't he? Was that that one? Communications first COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, there were some um, recommendations identified, particularly around our customer. Uh, through our customer right. experience team, um, particularly around our incoming calls. So, can we just hold that one, just because he's just had to step out of the room for a moment. Okay. Um, I'm sure it's fine, but sure. uh, I know he was very keen initially on that. So let's just go to what's next, or oh, talent management. So the talent management report. Um, obviously this was brought to you at the last um, meeting in August um, with the recommendations. Uh, this is now live and um, the PNC manager is responsible for the majority of these. Um, thankfully, um, most of the dates are coming up this month. Um, I've not been advised whether Liana's going to be behind on this, the PNC manager, but they're on track at the moment. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I was just, okay. just updating. But um, Stephanie in particular, I'm looking to you in this space with your worldly expertise or thoughts or comments um, in and around anything. I know you won't know if things really on track or off track, but just what you've seen in front of you. Look, nothing, nothing jumped out at me from that. I think um, you know, the devil's in the detail of that kind of thing. But um, from what I've seen, I don't have any particular uh, questions or queries. So. Uh, just remind me what we should expect to receive in this. Once things you ask us to yes, agree that they are closed, mm -hmm. what should we expect to receive given this ongoing development of, we've got a bubbling issue here of, of all things talent, people coming or people going actually, um, for whatever reason. And so, so, so that's been incorporated here. What are we going to expect to get from you? So it would only be um, where we would be providing frameworks or policies or other documentation like that from um, the PNC team would be presenting that to the committee, it wouldn't be for us. We're actually just, the role here of the corrective actions is just that we make sure yeah, that we're they're, they're continuing to that. take action and be And as life out. moves on and people come and go as they're allowed to, to so it's, mm, maybe there's something we can't correct. But this, this points to my other thing, I'd, the audit team side of things, in that there's been other discussions around the risks to organ the organisation of not having as much as possible down pat and a good, good health and safety policies, health being all aspects of, of health in, an, in a workplace. So I guess um, may, maybe it's just a, it's another discussion to have as we build upon this. So you're right, you, we've got some operational issues to implement, have they been implemented, yes or no? But there's another discussion to have, I think, um, which we can touch on again at another meeting in and around all things um, personnel for the organisation. Um, you're nodding your head there, James? Yeah, Chair, look, I was wondering whether for the next meeting of this committee um, we ask uh, Liana Monteith, the People and Capability Manager, to attend and, and the committee can ask 
mm. a range of questions in relation to both these corrective actions, but also just more generally um, on personnel issues. Great. And can I invite her, sorry, who was it? Liana. Liana, yep. uh, to engage maybe with Stephanie, uh, just, just so when that arrives at the meeting, um, I'll be asking you to take the lead on it sure. to help us through. Okay, thanks. I'm okay there to accept those. I just want to take us back now that uh, Neil's um, back with uh, just his thoughts. So the question to us, Neil, page five, um, there was a post-COVID response around the comms this organisation was party to and around first COVID lockdown last year, etc. This report is about, yes, some issues were realised and some management actions have been taken, therefore can we close um, this, are you comfortable? Um, FARS, and I know you had a particular interest in this when it ar arose, so I'm just asking if you have any thoughts or questions or comments in around that one before we agree to close it or otherwise. Well, I just, I guess it's just the uh, st st staff providing the assurance that the um, new capability is there and it works. Um, you know, that. Um, yes, so uh, regarding the, um, the new software for the telephone. Um, is certainly in place. So we have a, now we have a cloud-based uh, technology. So the telephones were able, the most recent lockdown, were able to uh, answer the telephone working remotely from home. So that was certainly put in place during the most recent lockdown. So we're able to um, operate remotely. Um, whereas the previous lockdown, the first lockdown, we had to um, transfer the, the phones through to the Palmerston North um, service. So we're now able to, to operate remotely um, and we certainly have built um, capacity, um, capability and increased the um, capacity within our customer experience team. So we certainly, I think, have made some real improvements in, in that. Um. Sure. Um, the, the, there was a sort of a follow-on from that was the, um, uh, the, the messages that those, even though they're working remotely, yeah. uh, are they giving consistent the same message as everyone on, on the same page? Yeah. So is there a structure and system in play that ensures that they get the correct messages at the correct, correct time? That, yeah, we do continue, need to continue working on that, and I think that's something that through any in any new event we continue to need to work on, and that's the communication through the CEDM team um, and the response team um, and our um, internal team as well. So sure. that I think in any event, whether it's a, um, a COVID response or a, any civil defence response is something that we continue to need to work on sure. um, with our customer experience team, but it is something that I'll be working on with my team. Okay. Um, so we go beyond the, the COVID scenario and for example, the, um, the, the, the uh, tsunami. earthquake or uh, both earthquake and tsunami event was a moving feast, uh, you know, quite rapidly during the day. Um, and I'd be interested to know, is there a process to ensure SEDEM, for example, the messages from there are going to our telephony team? Um, and even further than that, what's the connection with, say, Napier City's communication team uh, to make sure they've got the same messages? And, I mean, we obviously have the issues on online with uh, that capacity. So it's, it's tying that together and we get back to, to where uh, Craig's original question comes along. Um, are we sufficiently satisfied to close that item um, uh, or is there ongoing work that needs to be tabled so that we can close that item? So I, I, think, it's, I think it's closed. Um, so uh, CEDAM understand that um, the expectation is that their um, public information messaging is provided to each of the council's um, our telephony systems so that that's available to people that call councils. Um, and obviously the issues, I think, as you're aware, around um, the overloading of the, the website have been addressed as well. The, the tension that will continue to remain in this is that, um, you know, when you know, the Facebook page, I think, you know, was getting sort of, you know, 20 or 30,000 hits on that day, um, the last thing we want is everybody calling councils for advice because uh, we can't, we couldn't possibly deal with that sort of volume. So we're always going to try and push people to the online resources and away from calling um, our, our call centres. But people will inevitably still call council, um, particularly if they've got some very specific and personal uh, issues. And we do need to ensure that the people on the end of the phone 
uh, can provide some meaningful advice. Um, there's also a limitation uh, of obviously in, in an unfolding event about what information you know we're able to give people when there's so much uncertainty about impact and timing and all those sorts of things. So it's just an imp imperfect science. So those changes that were made are in place and has been closed, and I think we've crossed that bridge before. But even even the you know just just where this discussion suddenly went, it's kind of this. How how can we um, the, the gain the assurance, even not necessarily at this committee, that let's just say uh, we're given notice that we're locking down at midnight tonight, level four in this region, and we've there are vulnerable people all over the place needing to be managed. Um, at some stage, be it a CDM brief or something uh, across council, walk us through the changes that have been made or how that should now work perhaps. We may have seen something like that, but just comes kind, of, kind of real world example um, of that. Maybe it's a, um, again, without stretching resources or, or putting any other work aside. So again, that, that, again, it's the real world stuff where we worry and fret and the public fully expect us to have consistent messages. Okay, Neil? Mm. Thanks, okay. So we went through that one, then we went through the talent, which we had a bit of a chat about. Mm -hmm. What's it last? Oh, that is talent. Yeah? Yep. Yes. And then you've got your list of closed. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we need to be worried about in, an, in em any emerging issues? Is there anything you think we should be, well, in fact, to you and Helen, uh, paying a, any smoke signals you feel or see that this organisation, this, this committee, may be particularly interested in and around risk audit, transparency, accountability? Um, no, I don't personally have anything of concern. I think. Um, probably a bit of assurance around um, our COVID response is that with the looking like a lot of a change of strategy of how um, nationally we are responding to COVID, we have set up a working group and we are looking at uh, the potential for that in terms of business disruption while the what we did with the work from home and the pandemic process and things are certainly still fit for purpose. We're just looking at the extension of what that might mean on supply chains and that type of activity. So that just gives you a bit of assurance, I suppose, that we have definitely got that business disruption risk on our radar and um, we're formally and systematically looking. That's that great. Thank you. And although at the end of the day we're only in charge and looking at this organisation, other organisations which we essentially fund, manage, such as Hawke's Bay Tourism, are very much party to supply chain and logistical downturns, and that will have consequences across our region, i.e. tourists not coming here. Um, that's not a direct responsibility of us, but it will impact us um, and some of the board, boards that report to us, which I am on, Hawke's Bay Tourism. OK. Sorry for putting you in the hot spot like that, but okay. um, <laughs> that's what it's all about, the robustness of the audit committee. OK. You're done? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we had an item... Oh, what, what have I not done? Oh, Procedure report? We're gonna go into, yeah, we're just going to go into... No, 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 but if you want no, to item first. You've yep. got an item... James has got an item he wants to discuss with us before we do that. Excuse me, Chair. We need to move and receive... Oh, sorry. Resolutions? Yes, the recommendations as is from the annual enterprise audit plan. Um, so moved by myself. Um, one, two, three and four. Neil is seconding those. Thanks very much. They're passed. Maybe that we had. Um, but the internal assurance dashboard item that we just considered that one as well. Did, oh, sorry, didn't I just do that? What did I just do? Oh, sorry. You no, I've, I've done the other one twice. Forget yeah, what I just so said because that was, was the wrong the recommendation. Bit, okay. That was yes, the non-edited that's, version. That's easy enough to fix. Um, and tape. Internal dashboard recs are yes. also the one same. through four. Um, I've moved those, Neil seconded those. Yes. Um, and now if I can just say that um, we're required to take a break after two hours. Mm -hmm. Are we? Okay, there is some tea and coffee over there. All right. Sure, that's kindly. Okay, so what am I doing? I'm suspending. No, I'm not. Adjourn I'm for adjourning for maybe 10 minutes. Um, and we'll be back.
cup of tea as described by our union agreement. <laughs> Having a shocker, Chair.
Okay, we've just got a uh, verbal item that James, um, CEO, wants to raise with us and have a very brief discussion, more of a heads up, I think, than anything. Um, and then after that, we've got an item which will go into public excluded. So, James. So, a little bit of background. The Tungoyo Soil Conservation Reserve is a, um, a block of uh, forest land on the State Highway north to... Um, uh, to Tera, and if you can think of the, the Devil's Elbow, um, it's the land above and below uh, that stretch of road. Um, it was uh, acquired by the Crown following significant rain event in 1938 and has been uh, planted and managed uh, in a succession of forest rotations uh, to uh, prevent soil erosion um, over that period of time. Uh, as a consequence of the treaty settlement with the Mangahauru Tangitu Trust, which is the post-settlement um, entity uh, based at Tangoyo, um, owing to the significant conf confiscation of land by the Crown historically from um, that um, hapu, the Crown uh, returned the land under the forest to Mangahauru Tangitu. Um, but uh, because of the need to, uh, to remain a soil conservation reserve for soil conservation purposes has uh, vested the asset in the regional council to continue to manage uh, in partnership with Mangahururi Tangitu. Um, the forest is undergoing a progressive program of harvest and um, as a consequence the council holds uh, financial reserves in relation to that forest, so we, we receive the income from the, the forest being um, harvested, and we have to apply that uh, income to the ongoing management of the forest and the replanting and what have you. Um, the settlement provided for us to make uh, payments on a as available basis, I think, um, Jess can correct me if I'm wrong on some of the detail on this, um, from the reserves, uh, any surplus, if you like, to Mangahururu Tangitu for them to apply for to, to their tribal purposes. Um, historically, because it's not our money to manage, uh, the funds have been um, just managed uh, as all of our financial reserves uh, is effectively managed as cash and uh, not invested. Um, the Mangahauru Tangitu Trust is investing the balance of its uh, other assets uh, in managed funds and particular growth initiatives to uh, achieve in the order of a 5% return on, on capital. And so they have asked whether or not Council would be willing to place the reserve funds into a managed arrangement to achieve a higher rate of return and therefore more financial um, uh, return uh, from, for them from the funds. So having looked at it, um, it looks prima facie like uh, that could be something that could be achieved. It would r require a, um, an amendment to our Treasury policy to provide for this, and we would need, obviously, to enter into an arrangement with um, the Mangahauru Tangitu Trust to indemnify the Council, I guess, from any um, losses that could occur from managing those funds in a, um, in a more uh, aggressive manner and um, I guess uh, we would want to also explore just from a, um, an efficiency point of view uh, placing those funds with our existing fund managers so we didn't have additional overheads and those funds just benefited from being managed accordingly. Um, so it's not entirely straightforward, it has some fish hooks associated with it but um, having received the request uh, I advise the trust that uh, would be put to this committee as the next uh, possible um, meeting um, uh, to seek some guidance about whether you want us to explore this further and bring back a proposal. Anything you want to add, Jess? No, just um, we do also need to, um, to look at a piece of work in the um, Treasury policy and um, following on from the work that we did around our investment strategy. We have um, agreed or we have decided to, um, to set up a um, a reserve for our in, um, in the investment space around um, for the um, for the investment um, under in the treasury policy for our investment reserve. Um, so returns over and above our investment um, achieved by our investment um, 
the fund. fund. The income equalisation? Yeah, the yeah. income equalisation fund, sorry. So uh, we do need to um, set that fund up. So that's a, a piece of work that we need um, our um, revenue accountant or our finance team to undertake. So that also needs to be incorporated into the Treasury policy. So those two pieces of work could be undertaken uh, together um, and incorporated into the Treasury policy. So it would make sense that we we look at um, um, doing those two pieces of work together. Okay, so, so cut straight to the chase. It's great that um, we'll welcome the, the uh, they're coming by you, uh, CEO. That, that's fantastic. Um, but before we go to the administrative things we have to do, um, so if, if the result of this is, would you like us to pursue this further, present a paper at some stage to this committee or continue the discussion? No problem there at all. In that paper, though, I'd be asking um, to describe, are there any other instances of this? What are we allowed to do legally, given this was set up by some statue or someone trying to do a, um, a quick fix to help facilitate it? Um, then any direction given by the Crown or any other parties at the time, if there's any legal fish hooks in there. Um, and then we go to the financial expectations of the money where it sounds like we're holding on behalf what obligations, expectations they have. The moment someone mentions a percent, there's an expectation there. We are not a financial manager of anything other than our own balance sheet. And so there may be fish hooks there because we are not registered in any way, shape or form. Doesn't mean none of this can happen and, and it uh, just means we have to tread very carefully to try and tidy something up, which as you presented it, James, sounds we sh maybe should explore. Craig, just before you go there, just uh, there might be some questions before, I mean, it sounds like giving an instruction for the paper. Oh, no, 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 I said if there's a paper to come, okay. that's well, where it needs to go, but hold on. Um, and then there's a bunch of other issues in and around there that need to be explored. Sure, that's okay, but, but we haven't quite got to the point of saying let's produce a paper yet. No, I haven't done that. Um, how much money is involved with, how much money are we sitting in our accounts and where is it? What is it doing currently in oh. relation to the reserve? To, the, sorry, the management. Their, their money. No, our money. So ebbs and flows a bit with uh, forest harvest activity, um, but in the back of my mind, roughly about two million. Yeah, it's uh, approximately about two, two million. And we've got that what on current account, or what are we doing? Well, it's just incorporated in our cash reserves. Cash reserves. So yeah, uh, I, I, it's the, so with, with all of our reserves. As I understand it, we don't hold cash necessarily. It, it sits on the balance sheet, and so we've got our cash management over here. Obviously, our our borrowings, uh, and then we have our reserves, which effectively is an accounting treatment of a position uh, of of uh, of equity in the in the balance sheet. So that it's a it is it's a bunch of equity we hold, but it's not necessarily there's not a two million dollar um, set aside of cash in a bank account. The proposition is that um, when the Haruru come in, uh, they've got how much are they looking? How much is in there? How much money are they looking to invest? Well, the two no, two million. Here now. No, no, their money. So the, no, no, the, the, the this, note, is, the, this is their money that we're the referring to. The proposition to. that you put yep. in my mind was that over here they've got settlement. No, 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 no. The other funds they're not proposing to bring it at all. They just want us the money that we hold effectively on their behalf. They yes. would like to see more actively managed to work harder for internally. For so they're not saying economies of scale. We've got all this money from our settlement. No, no. We want to join the two together and invest it separately. So, no, that's not. The, so I'm yep. trying to clarify what the proposition is. Yep. It's because of what's on the, the title of this particular block of land, the Tongyo Soil. Yep. Yeah, I, I know not really well this, this particular block. Uh, so, so we're holding it currently in in reserve, and we're getting our usual reserve return on that. It's not part of our investment portfolio, um, and are suggesting to extract it out of our reserves, put it into a much more active account, and manage it. Who would manage it? Well, that is a choice that's open to us, obviously. I mean, we that's, could... Yeah, they're suggesting that we place it with the, either one of our current in, existing fund in, managers yeah, yeah. just so it achieves a better return than it's has, currently has achieving. Has a standalone uh, investment? Well, either we add it to one of our existing yeah, funds or yeah. it in a bespoke fund. 
the quantum sabbatical. They would just like to see it achieving a better return than it's currently achieving on their behalf. What's our drawdown on requirement on it in terms of managing the, the, the asset? So it, it ebbs and flows with forest harvest activity and obviously the price of logs is, is determinate as well. So we need to provide you with some advice about what that forward profile looks like. Couldn't tell you off the top of my head. We pass through everything. Exactly, through. yes, yes we do. So we're just kind of administrator. Sounds like we, we've got a degree of uh, risk obligation yes. to explore this further and take it further than this, dis this discussion. So your question is, should we put it into a paper? It's mine, actually. So, so on balance, are you comfortable there? I, I think. Okay. I, I think. okay. With a raft of issues to, to be fulfilled in that sort of the paper. Any thoughts, or high level thoughts to? No, look, I think if we're going to, if we're going to go to a paper, let's just do that and have the wider, more in depth discussion there with more detail. In Absolutely. Terms. Absolutely risk. So, I mean, but get the ball rolling and start with the paper. Okay. And Stephanie? Yeah, agree with the paper. Um, I'd want some detail around the legal obligations on how often it's meant to be paid out and sort of the status of the funds, or would there be some concept that it might be changing in status and suddenly those funds maybe are held on trust if they're not already? And would that mean that council is investing it as trustee on behalf of? Mm. Um, because then the fund manager is going to say who's the client here and what are their investment objectives. So all of those things would need to be um, ironed out significantly. Okay, so general support, uh, yes, please present this further. Just are there other examples of this that we're doing this on behalf of anybody else that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware so of. So something kind of unique. specific to this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you've heard the kind of general thoughts. I imagine there'd be, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I think it's be welcomed and if we can help facilitate, no worries, but all these other issues. Interested to, to see where you, you mentioned, you know, would we need a shift in policy to, to make that happen? I'd be interested to know what the impediments are for it to be, what's the requirement to have a policy change? Um, and it raises a bigger question actually, um, quantum of our cash reserves and when, in fact, we trigger those going into um, in, into um, uh, a more long-term investment or into the investment pool. So that's yeah, a is, yeah. sort of and, and also collateral um, discussion about that. That's I, right. I can't recall what the policy it looks yeah. like. Yeah. And, and it's if you point to where these have been presented in our accounts, because they've been on our balance sheet, but they're not ours. So we must have something on the other side which says we have to pay this out. Someone, someone well, has a claim to this. Yeah. So there may be some accounting tidy up to do there since whenever it was put in place. It's in reserve balance on our balance sheet, so it's... But it's still reserve. an asset. But it sounds like we've got a liability somewhere. Mm. Yeah, well, the, li the liability only arises from surpluses that might... Yeah, so we, long, long term, you don't... Yeah. Yep. I think there's been a surplus every year. OK, all right. <clears throat> Thanks, James, for bringing that to us and whoever contacted you. Um, yeah, we appreciate them engaging with us. Bring it back. OK, nothing else there. So can I, um, this part of the meeting, then we've fulfilled our agenda. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll now uh, move that we go into public excluded. Can you back uh, second that, Neil, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you seconded too. passed. Um,